Well, last night we began to look at the doctrine of justification uh, and I introduced you to Martin Luther. Martin Luther lived 500 years ago in Germany and his struggles to understand how anyone can be right with a holy God led to his rediscovery of this great Bible truth about justification. It's really important that we don't think that Martin Luther invented justification. Uh, God invented justification and Martin Luther just rediscovered it as it had been lost largely uh, in his day. Very simply put, justification means this. God pardons, accepts, and declares sinners to be just on the basis of Christ's death, which takes away our sin, and his righteousness given to us as a gift. That is the doctrine of justification. Justification is ours by faith, not by works. In other words, I am declared just by God by trusting him and not by trying to earn it myself, by any means. Martin Luther always struggled because he thought of God's righteousness as some terrifying, holy, wrathful judgment hanging over us rather than, as Paul describes it in the book of Romans, as a wonderful gift of grace. That's what God's righteousness revealed in the gospel is, a gift Paul talks about it in 117, Romans 117. For the gospel, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as is it written, the righteous will live by faith. Or as Martin Luther translated it, this is the English version of his German, he who is righteous by faith will live. He who is righteous by faith will live. How am I justified? How am I declared just in God's sight? Well, the answer is by faith. I'm trusting that Jesus' obedience will be applied to my account. All that Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection are applied to me, imputed to me, reckoned to me by God so that he sees Christ instead of me. As one person I was reading recently says very simply, Righteousness is not within our ability to achieve. God himself freely gives it. I really like that. It's a really good summary. Righteousness is not within ourselves to achieve. God himself freely gives it. So the first and most important practical application of this wonderful doctrine of justification is to the way that we declare the good news to the world, is an application to unbelievers. How does a person get right with God? Well, they get right with God through justification by faith. Salvation is not based in any way on what they do, or importantly, not based on what God does in them. This is not to deny the doctrine of regeneration. God does change us. But that's not the basis of justification. It's not that God starts a work in us and he thinks, oh, yeah, I did a good job there, I'll justify that person. Justification is external to us, alien to us, as Luther described it. It's outside of us. It's not to do with us at all. We are justified not by being made holy, but by being declared to be holy because of Christ. It's the courtroom language of the judge. He looks at us, and because we are forgiven by Jesus' death, and his righteousness is applied to us, we are therefore in the judge's sight just. We are justified. So, like I say, the first application uh, of this doctrine is for people who are not yet Christians. It's for the world to hear the good news that Jesus lived and died and rose again so that we could be justified by faith. It's all about him and not about us. The second main application, and again, I'm just doing one tonight. uh, The second main application of this doctrine is actually to us as Christians. And it's this. I can be confident about God's love for me and my continued acceptance because I am justified by faith, not by works. Okay, just again, just to get that clear, I can be confident as a believer, as a Christian, I can be confident about God's love for me and my continued acceptance because I am justified by faith and not by works. Practical application one, anyone can be saved because justification by faith is God's gift. Practical application two, as a Christian, I can have continuing peace, joy and assurance because I am justified by faith. That in a nutshell is all I've got to say. 
I'm a preacher, so that's not where I end. But that is essentially where all I've got to say tonight. And if you've got that, then praise God, because that's job done. I want to go back to Martin Luther just for a moment and try for just a a short while and try and explain to you what that second application looked like for him. I talked a bit last night about this German word, Anfestung, which is very difficult to translate into English because it describes a number of things. Soul anguish, struggles, spiritual terror, despair. And these are the things that Martin Luther felt at various times in his life. These feelings of terror and despair were really intense. And this is how Luther himself describes it in his own words. Now, he's quite clever in this, in, in this section of a, a, a piece that he was writing. He says, I know a man. And we've all read our Bibles, so we know what that means. He's talking about himself. And he's talking about his struggles, these, these moments of spiritual terror. And he says, they were so great and so much like hell that no tongue could adequately express them no pen could describe them and no and one who had not himself experienced them could believe them so great were they that if they had been sustained or had lasted for half an hour even for one tenth of an hour he this man luther would have perished completely would have been reduced to ashes At such a time, God seemed so terribly angry, and with him the whole creation. At such a time, there is no flight, no comfort within or without, but all things accuse. In this moment, it is strange to say, the soul cannot believe that it can ever be redeemed. Writing as a Christian not as an unbeliever, as a Christian. Now, that is really strong language, but it helps us to see something of the struggle that Luther had in wrestling with God's holiness and his own sinfulness as a believer. Simply put, you with I know how it is when we fail and we mess up. As a Christian, you sin you let the Lord down in some way and you think to yourself when you come to your senses, I am an utter failure. Now, that's a very strong feeling. That can, in fact, be pretty overwhelming when you don't measure up to your own standard. It can be a real blow to your ego. I'm not what I thought I was. I remember one woman that... I was involved in counselling who had been sexually involved with another man in her church. And she said to me, I'll never forget these words, it was a long time ago now, but she said to me, I never thought I would be that person. It's a sobering thing to suddenly realise that you are that person, isn't it? But then imagine what it feels like to suddenly be struck with a sense of, not of your own failure to measure up to your own standard, but to be struck with a sense of God's wrath. Not that you simply let yourself down, or simply let other people down, or simply failed to meet some sort of socially agreed standard of morality, rather struck with the sense that you're under God's wrath. What would it be like, what would it feel like to be so utterly aware of the sinfulness of your own sin that it felt like that there was no place to hide, no excuse to be made, no place to turn for comfort? Now, I think this affects people in different ways. Obviously, Luther in that piece is speaking about a very acute, in the sense of focused, experience. If it lasted for one-tenth of an hour, six minutes, it would have destroyed me. That's pretty intense. But it's not the same for everyone. My own experience of that profound sense of conviction post-conversion is much more protracted, much more um, protracted, something that lasts for a longer period of time, perhaps even months sometimes. We can have that sense that God's hand is heavy on us. Not, I don't, for a minute think with the same intensity that Luther felt in those moments but still that settled terrifying sense of God's displeasure 
It seems to me in life we spend uh, an extraordinary amount of energy trying to avoid thinking about this, don't we? Now, I'm not talking about unbelievers. I know unbelievers spend a lot of energy not thinking about stuff. That's why many people drink. That's why they take drugs. That's why they watch lots of TV, because it just helps to stop thinking, doesn't it? But I think as Christians, we can do this too, where we don't actually want to face what we are. So we spend a lot of time doing things so that we don't think about things. My experience is also that sometimes Christians can try to offset their behavior by gospel work. Now, I think that's a particularly dangerous path to get yourself on. This is where you think that if you do enough, you can somehow offset your carbon footprint. It's not your carbon footprint, your moral footprint. And so people throw themselves into all sorts of endeavors because they think somehow they can prove to God they're really serious about their sin. Or they can offset it in some way. You try and avoid thinking about it, but of course you can't. God just won't let us get away with it, will he? Because he, he loves us so much, he's not going to let us get away with that. We're his children, so he's not going to let us just ignore what we do or what we are. And sometimes you just can't get away from that sense that God sees and things are not right, and sometimes that can go on for a very long time. Now, I simply mention that so that we don't make a paradigm out of Luther. Luther's experience is not everybody's experience. It's not in the same way. But every single Christian, without exception, has moments in their lives when they feel the weight of their sin as believers. Feeling soul anguish can happen in different ways, and my encouragement to myself and to you is that applying the bible medicine for that feeling is very important to apply the right medicine to that condition is the thing we should do when you're in that situation there are a number of things that you can do to help repentance is key isn't it repentance being honest before god and confessing our sin is key Ongoing re- repentance, of course, is the normal Christian experience of uh, the normal experience of the Christian here on earth. In fact, it is the first of the ninety-five theses. If you've read through them, uh, some of them are more tedious than others. I think that would be fair to say. Number one is absolutely amazing. Here's number one: When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, "Repent," He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. That's a massive encouragement to me, because that means it's normal. It's normal to repent, and that's how it should be, until we get to heaven. So repentance is important when we're feeling that. Secondly, seeking out contact with other Christian people is extremely important. Martin Luther understood that. He also argued for the correct application of lots of beer. I'm certainly not going to argue for that. But it was fellowship with other people, being with other people. is such good medicine. This kind of thing is really good medicine, isn't it? To be with other Christians, to sing together, to encourage each other. That's why we're not to give up meeting together, because we need each other, because it's too difficult to be a Christian on your own. Those poor people that God allows protracted periods of solitary confinement, what a dreadful punishment, the worst punishment almost. And that's not us. We've got each other. What a blessing to seek out fellowship. But I think, and there are other remedies for this this soul language, but I think we must also preach. I think that every single Christian should be a preacher. Oh, dear. I think every single Christian should preach to their own hearts. I think we must preach to ourselves and declare the word to our own hearts. What do I preach to myself? Well, I preach that God has and does now and will continue to love me because he has justified me by faith. That's what I preach to my heart. God has, does, and will continue to love me because he has justified me by faith. I think justification is one of the key medicines for a Christian who is feeling condemned. Now, to show you that, let me just take you to Romans 8.33. Uh, this is the verse. It will probably help you to have this open because it fits into a whole 
a, a wonderful section. As Malk said, this is quite rightly a, a, a purple passage for Christians. It is a wonderful chapter. Here's the verse. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Not difficult to see why I chose that verse, because it actually mentions the justification word group. It's, it's, it's the same idea. It's a clear, from even a quick glance at verse 33 of Romans 8, that Paul is using courtroom language. It's as if we're in the dock and somebody is accusing us. What's the answer to all these accusations? Well, it is God's justification. It is God who justifies. But let me just take a moment to set a scene, set the scene uh, a little for Romans 8, and then hopefully we'll feel the real joy of that verse. Romans 8 is a marvellous chapter. It's often described as the passage about the Holy Spirit because, statistically speaking, the Holy Spirit is spoken about so often in Romans 8, it is almost difficult to not see it as the chapter about the Holy Spirit. He's obviously the one who is at the heart of conversion. He's the one who makes us new, who gives us life, who regenerates us, who sanctifies us. But is that really what Romans 8 is all about? Undoubtedly, he's right there at the heart of what's going on. But is it Paul writing as a, a pneumatology, a, a sort of a word on the spirit? I don't think so. I agree with others who think that actually Romans 8 is all about assurance. I think that's what the chapter's all about. Assurance, confidence, hope. Let me try and demonstrate that. How does the chapter start? Verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. What a cracking start to a chapter. How does it end? There is no height nor depth nor anything else in all creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Begins with no condemnation, ends with no separation. What a cracking chapter. I mean, don't you, just even the first verse and the last verse, your heart goes, oh, yes, this is amazing. But then it's all the stuff in the middle, too, that is, is just the same. It's just wonderful. No condemnation, no separation, and it's a chapter all about assurance of the heart. It has sections of warning and challenge. It's very real about the struggles uh, of this life as we wait for the end, the eschaton. I mean, it's very, it's very honest about that, the, the groaning of chapter 8 is very honest. But all of this is designed by Paul to assure our hearts, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to make us sing. That's what Romans 8 is about. And at the end of that is the paragraph that contains our verse. The paragraph is made up of five questions. Um, Question one, who can be against us? Who? Who? No one, thanks for taking pity on the poor preacher. No one, the answer, that's what, that's what Paul expects from us. Nobody can stand against us. That doesn't mean that Christians are always right and whatever we plan to do, everybody else needs to get out of the way. It just means in terms of our eternal security and significance and, and who we are, nobody can stand against us. Question two, will he not give us everything? Answer, of course, yes. Of course he will give us everything. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The question there is uh, one of God's continuing grace. How can I know that God will still supply all of my need tomorrow? I'm not in tomorrow. How can I know that? How can I be confident of that? Well, we can know because of his unbelievably generous kindness to us in the past. And I can be sure that he will be kind to me in the future. And particularly, Romans 8, give me the inheritance that he's promised. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It's one of my favourite allusions in the New Testament to the Old Testament. Who was the son who was spared in the Old Testament. It was Isaac, wasn't it? We know the story very well. And what a painful story, particularly um, for those of us who've had the privilege of parenthood. The thought of sacrificing a child is unbearable. It's absolutely unbearable. And there's Abraham on Mount Moriah, and God says to him, sacrifice your son. And what does Abraham do? Well, he goes to do it. That is unthinkable. 
but God spares his son. How relieved do you think Abraham felt? <laughs> I mean, it must have been overwhelming. Whew. But God doesn't spare his son, does he? In fact, he watches his son. All that abuse and all that shame. And how can we doubt then, uh, when we consider that, that he's not going to give us everything when he's already given us that? How can we doubt that the future will be anything but secure when he's given us his son? So question one, who can be against us? Answer, no one, because God is for us. Question two, will God continue to give us everything? But of course he will, because he's already given us his son. We'll miss question three, we'll come back to that. Question four, who condemns us? Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Three things that Paul says there that uh, answer our condemnation or any potential condemnation. Jesus died. He dies in my place. And he is condemned instead of me. So what con condemnation is there left? He's already been condemned. So how can I be condemned when he's been condemned in my place? His resurrection. His resurrection is the means by which God publicly declares that Jesus has triumphed and won. Sin is not the victor. Jesus is. So the resurrection, in the resurrection, we have proof that Jesus' sacrifice is accepted. And then thirdly, Christ's intercession in heaven. Imagine the best defense lawyer you could possibly have standing for you. And here he is taking our part, pleading his sacrifice as all sufficient to cover all that we have done. Before the throne of God above I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair, does he ever do that to you? When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within... Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. There we go, there's justification by faith. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect, spotless righteousness. The great, unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Saviour and my God. That is a great hymn. They are great words. That's what I preached to my heart. When paralysed by a sense of my own guilt and shame, when we are paralysed by a sense of our own guilt and shame, we look to heaven we don't look inside, we look to heaven to see Jesus is both our answer and our advocate. Question five, who shall separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Paul's answer in short to question five is no thing, no one. Nothing. Nothing is even remotely capable of separating us from that love. Do you see how that's about assurance? Do you see? It's just wonderful encouragement, isn't it? But back to question three. Who can bring a charge against us? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Now, the way that this verse is constructed, uh, verse 33, it is very likely that Paul is actually thinking about the future. He's thinking about standing before God on judgment day and waiting for the verdict to be given on his life. Almost certainly what Paul's got in mind here in verse 33. I've got a marriage on uh, Saturday that I've got to conduct for um, a couple who are in the military, and uh, so I'm looking forward to that. That'll be a good event. I hear tell that uh, when they have an honour guard from the military, they draw their swords at certain parts. I'm, I'm a bit nervous about that. Well, we'll see if that happens or not. But you know that awkward moment in, in every wedding? If anyone knows of any lawful reason why these two may not be married, let them speak now or forever hold their silence. When everybody's looking around, there's a bit of nervous giggling going on. They're just a bit nervous, just in case anybody does stand up and say, that's my husband. 
Well, it's a bit like that. that that's, who's going to condemn? That's the feeling. Or maybe better, this illustration. Imagine that you're due in court tomorrow. That would be a sobering thing, wouldn't it? You're due in court tomorrow, and you've got to go to bed tonight. You're not going to get much sleep, I imagine. And you're thinking to yourself, I wonder what will be said tomorrow. So Paul is saying here, who's going to stand up and speak against us? And who could that be? Well, certainly it could be our own consciences, couldn't it? Sometimes we can feel feel overwhelmed. I said this at the beginning with a sense of our own sinfulness. Our consciences can shout out against us. Have you ever been troubled by something that you've done, perhaps in the past, perhaps even in the distant past? And somehow it just keeps coming back to your mind, and you're just troubled, and your conscience troubles you about that thing. You feel ashamed. But it's not just the conscience, of course. It can be someone else who accuses us. Who is the accuser who wants to bring charges against God's people? Well, in a striking verse in Revelation, the devil is described in this way. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. Now, when you read that, you should really go, Yes! That's amazing! The accuser who's been doing it for so long and been doing such a good job, he's been kicked out. He's been thrown down. But that's what he is, and we're actually in the phase where he's doing that at the moment. Martin Luther particularly felt that, the devil tearing at him and accusing him, bringing charges against him, the famous ink stain on the wall and all that stuff, as he threw the ink well at the wall, purportedly at the devil. He had some pretty colourful names for Satan, which are unrepeatable in polite company, uh, but he knew what it was. It was. He knew what it was to be accused by Satan reading through various biographies and the experience of talking to different people suggests to me that this is not a totally uncommon thing. The concern is that if I was really up for examination and everything was revealed, I could be accused, couldn't I? Isn't that true? What's the answer to that? Well, it's Romans 8.33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? No one, because it is God who justifies. The answer to the accusers, our conscience, the devil, is the doctrine, the truth of, the, of God's justification. Who is going to accuse me in God's courtroom when, on the last day when he, the judge, has declared me righteous? In justification, we are acquitted of all the accusations against us and, more than that, positively credited with all the goodness of Jesus. You know that phrase that was popular in the past, justified means just as if I'd never sinned. That's all right, but it's only half a truth because it's not just as if I've never sinned. I mean, that's amazing. Expiation, the taking away of sin, what an amazing truth. But that's not That's only half the truth of justification. Justification is expiation, but it's also imputation. It is the giving of Jesus' goodness to us, his righteousness to us. His righteousness becomes mine through faith. And so any accusations that the devil or our consciences make against us are absolutely silenced. Now, I'm well aware that There are other things that God has given us to help us when we're feeling condemned. But I have to say, I think the objective truth of justification is a massive help to me when I'm feeling condemned. Perhaps we could illustrate this by thinking what it would look like if we took away the doctrine of justification. So this is a bit of a mind experiment, and this is a scary one. But let's just, we'll imagine that, that the doctrine of justification is not true. What will that look like? I'll tell you what it looked like. I am left terrified that I might not have done enough, that I might not have walked faithfully enough, might not have changed, been changed internally enough, not preached enough sermons, not taught enough Sunday schools, not knocked on enough doors. 
Did I talk to enough people? Did I spend enough time in prayer? Did I make the best use of my money and other resources that I've been entrusted with? Was I sufficiently repentant? There's a good one for us strict Baptists. Was I sufficiently repentant for my sin? But you see, with the doctrine of justification, I can go to sleep, and I will go to sleep tonight well. I'll go to sleep because it's not about me. It's about God justifying because of what Jesus has done. I stop looking inside. This is a big Martin Luther thing. You, you, you need to stop looking inside. You really do, because it's not a pretty sight. A friend of mine told me that he was ugly on the outside uh, the other day, and uh, yeah, that might be true of certain of us, but I'll tell you what, we're a jolly sight more ugly on the inside, so don't be looking inside. Just don't do that. It's not very helpful. What you need to do is look up. You need to look at Jesus. Because that's what the Father does, doesn't he? My life is hid with Christ. Which truth means that I am secure and I am loved and I will always be secure and I will always be loved because Jesus never changes. And that to me is the most wonderful practical application of this doctrine for me as a Christian. So practical application number one is to non-Christians. It's the gospel. God will take away your sin and credit, credit you with the goodness of Christ, the righteousness of God, if you will receive that by faith. Practical application two is to me. I can be confident about God's love for me and my continued acceptance because I am justified by faith, not by works. It is Christ's obedience in life and in death that allows me to come near with boldness and be confident that on the last day, the great day, I will stand because of him. In the end, everything is about Jesus. In the end, it is all about Jesus. And we're jolly glad that's true, aren't we? Mm-hmm.